Hi, everyone. I'm so excited to welcome you to today's Network at Work webinar. This is the final virtual program in our Springs Professional Development Series, Getting Unstuck, How to Overcome Overwhelm with Kristen Dabney, Class of 1990. My name is Christy Kennedy. I am an alum of the Class of 2010. I am an Albrighter. As I mentioned in passing when we were all chatting, I am looking at Albright House from my window in Alumni House right now. Um, I am also the director of alumni professional networks and career programs here at Smith. So very excited to be welcoming you all here today. I lead programs and events such as these that bring Smithies together to connect and build skills around their professional goals. So in addition to our virtual events, our team offers in-person networking opportunities. We also connect Smith alums with career coaches like Kristen for one-on-one -on -one support. And we are compiling on-demand resources for you to access at any time to meet your individual needs. So our philosophy is that anything a Smithy needs to find their personal version of career success exists within our network, and my team is here to help you do so. I want to take a moment to introduce our featured coach for today to all of you, Kristen Booz Dabney, class of 1990. Kristen Dabney is a 1990 graduate of Smith College, a master's trained counselor, and a certified life and leadership coach. She's combined all her skills into one title mindset coach. She teaches her clients the tools to master their minds in order to develop mental and emotional fitness. This is the surest path to getting unstuck, out of overwhelm, and to stop one's negative inner dialogue. So without further delay, I'll welcome Kristen to the virtual stage to lead us through today's workshop. Kristen, you can take it away. Great. Thank you so much. I'm um, delighted to be here, humbled, and uh, really am so hopeful that this will be very, very um, this will be very practical for you, that you'll walk away with some very practical attempt, uh, practical solutions to your overwhelm. So I am Kristen Dabney. I'm Kristen Booz Dabney, class of 90. I started in Baldwin, then moved to Wilder, then was a picker and went to London my junior year, and then graduated Wilder House. Um, and I'm a fun, fun, Smith alumna. I also, I was sharing with Christy, I wear a, a stack of bracelets that are all given from, from my Smithy friends. So they're all with me today. And I'm wearing red. I usually don't wear color, but we are class of 90 and we are the red, we are the red year. So I decided to honor that by, um, by wearing this color. Okay. I'm going to go ahead, Christy, and share my screen. I don't think there's a person here who needs to know the definition of overwhelm. It is an experience that many feel, especially women, and certainly is something that was heightened during COVID. Um, and some people use the word overwhelm. Some say paralyzed, spinning, drinking from a fire hose. You decide what word resonates with you, but I'm going to use the word overwhelm throughout the, throughout the talk. And I do not take for granted that time is a non-renewable commodity. We are going to be together for 90 minutes today. <clears throat> However, the first 15 minutes of my talk will be a decent enough overview that if you have to leave, you'll at least have a taste of what to come back for and watch and replay. And I will have revealed to you the three causes of overwhelm and teased at the solution. Okay. And this is just my little... Um, bit of housekeeping. You don't need to take notes. I've created, I'm feeling so fancy. I created a QR code <laughs> in the next slide. And the, the workbook that I've shared in advance is all about the first um, step of overwhelm, and that is managing your thoughts. But we're going to talk about two additional things as well that are a bit more tactical. And the workbook that I've made for you there will be available when you scan that QR code. Um, I also invite you to decide in advance that you're gonna learn something today, that there'll be something here that you can directly apply to your life. If there's something I say that is somewhat triggering, use that as data, not as a reason to stop listening or to challenge. Um, I'm all up for a challenge, that's perfectly fine. But I do find when I enter any kind of um, an experience, I always decide ahead of time that I'm going to delight in it and I'm going to get something out of it. So I invite you to do that today as well. And my professional mission is to reduce unnecessary suffering that's caused by overwhelm. Other people's missions are to reduce unnecessary suffering caused by food shortages or things that are happening in the environment or school systems or medically. And what I take so seriously is that if I can help you release your overwhelm, you can then be more um, available to do the work that you are called to do in this world. 
So there are three strategies I'm going to share, but they're not the only strategies. So these are the three that I use that move the needle the fastest with a client. And surely there are more and we can go much, much deeper. But I was trying to f figure out what would be the three easiest things for you to incorporate today into your life. And that's what we're doing. And I'm also wanted to offer that by me asking you to take responsibility for your own overwhelm, I'm not suggesting that there are not injustices, sexism, ageism, racism, incompetent leaders that, that create more chaos for us or more um, uncomfortable situations is what I'll refer to them as now. I'm not dismissing that. So don't think that when I'm sharing any of these examples, I'm ignoring some gross um, things that are going on, gr gross errors in our, in our civil society. Okay, and I'm also not recommending that these strategies are a first option if you're managing trauma or abuse, overwhelm that's coming from trauma or abuse. Okay, finally, I've had the honor of coaching many Smithies um, and it's sometimes been in their companies and in their nonprofits on the topic of overwhelm. Very few people really come and say, I'm feeling overwhelmed. It's usually a circumstance, right? I have lost my job or I... Um, I'm in a reorganization for the third time, or I want to go back to work. I've been home for 20 years and I want to re-enter the workforce. But really overall, there's a feeling of overwhelm about making a decision about next steps, about what to do. Salary negotiation, another one. One of my favorite topics is the salary negotiation. Um, so I know about how to help you eliminate overwhelm. I've worked with fellow Smithies to do it. So let's go. This is um, the last of the business. So this is the QR code you can take. You can open your, I'm just going to share in case people don't know, although we've all probably enjoyed menus via QR code recently. You take a picture of this and I am going to, um, I love gifts and I'm going to just randomly choose two names at five o'clock today of the people who have um, downloaded this workbook. This, and there are some Smithies on, on the call right now who I, who know how much I love this book. Playing Big is my favorite, favorite book. It's my most go-to gift book by Tara Moore, who's also a coach. And the, the um, subtitle is Practical Wisdom for Women Who Want to Speak Up, Create, and Lead. Such practical advice in here. And I relate a lot of my overwhelm um, knowledge to what I've learned from her. And then secondly, I am committed to supporting women doing wonderful work in this world for other women. And there is an organization called Thistle Farm in Nashville, Tennessee. Look it up, Google it. They are a social justice organization and they take women in who have been trafficked, abused, prostituted, addicted, incarcerated, and they um, are magic. They're magic. So uh, the other gift will be a $55 gift card. I chose $55 so that shipping would be free. <laughs> so that's what we're going to do there. Okay. Here's the mission to help you get clear on what actually causes overwhelm, to teach you three strategies, and then for you to leave with a practical solution. So I'm not going to go into a lot of detail or questioning about the time audit, but that was offered to you as an opportunity, as a as an exercise before we met. And I would just love to know if anyone did participate in the time audit, um, if you learned anything about the way you spend your time. Because so often what I hear for people in overwhelm is there's just not enough time. I'm overwhelmed because there isn't enough time. And the time audit that I shared with you was not a, a way to teach you how to manage your time, time blocking, color coding. It wasn't that. It was literally just an exercise for you to record two days of work, one day of not work. And if you work seven days a week, then three days of work. And if you don't work, then you understand what to do and see what's really happening in your day. See how often you might get interrupted, distracted, feel behind, um, how much of your time is spent in meetings versus one-on-one -on -one communication with somebody. But these are the kinds of things I often hear when people do conduct a time audit. Um, they don't realize how often they switch from one task to another. They um, I, listen, that fun game that we might have all played at the carnival that came to our town, whack-a-mole, is now like to me completely par um, linked to the term overwhelm, just that idea of constantly putting out fires or addressing other people's needs, how many interruptions you get. You can see these are some of the um, the things that I hear when people do conduct an honest time audit. And this is the thing. 
the reason we do these is so that you're not guessing how you spend your time. You're actually recording how you spend your time. And we often overestimate and underestimate in both areas, right? How we spend our time. So if you think that there isn't enough time in your day, you have 168 hours in a week. We all have the same number of hours. It's really helpful to see, gosh, if I'm going to work 40 of these or 50 of these, and if I'm going to sleep this many of them, what time is available for me? What's left for me to actually take care of things that I value, that I prioritize, um, in my life. Okay. So that's it for the time audit. We're going to move away from that conversation now. Oh, I, I misspelled that. Not what, what is causing you to feel overwhelmed. <laughs> um, again, if Christy could refer to the chat box, um, I'm going to give you a list of what I often hear causes overwhelm, but if any of you are willing and willing enough to share just even one thing that you, um, believe is causing your overwhelm. Feel free to drop that in the chat. Oh, Sarah says, boss, mm -hmm. fear. What else? What other things are causing overwhelm? Kids, oh wow, it's coming in now. My kid, I, my job, my husband, my life, inability to say no, desire to do everything well, elderly parents, to-do lists, not knowing where to start, Jane. That's a big one. Um, Juggling too many multiple commitments, menopause, teenagers, too many emails. I get it. My husband's recent death. I'm very sorry, Pamela. That's oh, really hard. I'm sorry too. Caring too much about too many things, procrastination, fear, last minute tasks, kids, clients, too many things I don't want to do. Are you seeing any of these? I love this. Okay. I mean, I don't love that that's what you're experiencing, but get ready. This is what I hear from most people. Find yours on this list because you basically just covered them. <laughs> um, lack of organization, work-life imbalance. We talked about family commitments, inflexible boss. Someone said fear and I have fear for getting something also, but just fear in general, lack of sleep, worry about money, children, an unhelpful partner, the need to overwork, so many options. You are. I want to normalize for you that this is exactly what most people um, say when they refer to their overwhelm. It's all these things that are outside of us, many of which we don't have control over, that we then feel at the mercy of, and that we attribute to overwhelm, our overwhelm. And I love this because um, when you're in that state of overwhelm, it's pretty uncomfortable, and you often want to do something to escape it fast. And we're Smith women. So what do we do? We take action. We live in the action line, right? We do something. And these are the kind of things we might do. Choose a new calendar system or order a meal service, secure more childcare, work all weekend, apply for a hundred jobs, do everyone else's work so that at least it gets done, right? Um, I didn't even refer to things about your elderly parent or grief or um, a partner, but this appears to be the way to handle. That's whack-a-mole, right? Like hit it, hit it, hit it, take an action. And while initially that can be helpful, it's literally just a Band-Aid. It doesn't address the foundational cause of overwhelm. So another thing we think is, oh, I know, I'll just change the facts of my life. If I can change certain things in my life, then I won't have overwhelm. I'll get a new job or I'll hire a new team. I'll find a new partner. I'll move. I'll cancel all the children's activities. I'll choose a new food protocol. And again, what happens is you take yourself with you. You take the way you think, the way you interpret situations, the stress you have, the way you activate your stress cycle, you take all of that with you to the new job, the new partner, the, the hiring of the team, and you still haven't solved for what actually is causing the overwhelm. So here we go. We have been conditioned to believe that it's something that's happening outside of us. It's a circumstance in our life, but I'm going to teach you the three causes or three of the many causes, but I would call them the overarching causes of overwhelm and you have control over all of them. And that's really good news. Here we go. The three causes are your thoughts. So what, what you're thinking in your brain that you get to have complete and total agency over unmade decisions. So open decisions, blurred or absent boundaries. And I'm going to go through each of these. So if you had to hop off now, you would at least know that it's your thoughts, your unmade decisions, and your blurred or absent boundaries that are actually causing the overwhelm. Um, none of these things can cause overwhelm. Every one of these things is actually 
neutral until you have a thought about it. And even when you say something like work-life imbalance, that is really implying that you've already assessed that it's not imbalanced. You've made an, you've made an opinion, you have an opinion about your work-life situation, right? Okay, so let's go back. We're going to start with what I think is the biggest one, the overarching one, and that is your thoughts. So we have about 70,000 thoughts a day. Most are on default. We're unaware of what we're even thinking. And that's good news because we don't want to have to rethink how to turn on the faucet or start the car or brush our teeth every day. But there are also thoughts that have become so practiced that we just think they're the news. We just think that they are absolute facts. And we just think that there are, um, that it is the workload's fault. It is the disorganization's fault, the deadline's fault, um, the boss's fault, the calendar's fault. But these are actually really stories you tell yourself about the circumstance. So your boss is a circumstance, is neutral until you have a thought about her. And when you have a thought about her, she's then going to create a feeling and we're going to go into what happens when that's the case. I did also want to share, Christy and Susan confirmed that all these slides will be sent to you after the fact. So feel free to take pictures, take notes if you'd like, but there really isn't necessary. You don't really need to because um, you're going to be receiving your own copy of this. Okay. So your thoughts are always optional. You are choosing what you think. And if you're not choosing what you think, if it's unintentional, you can become um, an intentional thinker. You can decide to, 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 to um, look at the situations in your life differently. So this is the model that I use. It's a version of cognitive behavioral therapy. It's been named a million different ways. I usually refer to it as the model, but I think it's helpful to say the think, feel, and act model. So you can just keep that as a, um, like a shortcut in your brain. So there's a circumstance. Anything that's happening in your life can fit into one of five categories. It's either a circumstance, which is a fact defensible in a court of law. Um, I would say today in Virginia, United States, it's Wednesday. And then that's a fact. Anyone looking at the calendar, looking where I live could confirm it's Wednesday. The thought is a sentence in your brain, an interpretation of the fact. A thought, I'm so behind, I have so much to do before Friday, is a thought. Someone else would say, oh my gosh, we're almost to the weekend. Can you see how there are two very different interpretations of the neutral circumstance, it's Wednesday. And then the thought is what creates the feeling. The circumstance has no impact on your feeling without a thought happening in between. And let me share that. I have a husband who was so sure he was going to break this model. When I first learned this five years ago, he said, just is it possible? It's not possible because I had this like gut reaction when something happens, when the circumstance happens. And fortunately, he has also slowed down enough to realize there's always a thought that happens before that feeling occurs, right? So if you're telling yourself, I'm behind, I only have two more days to get something done, the feeling you're going to create, which is a one word, is probably overwhelmed. If you're telling yourself, oh my God, it's almost the weekend, look, we're, look what's coming, the feeling is going to be something different, like maybe anticipation, excitement, something like that, right? Then all of your actions come from your feelings. The actions do not come from a circumstance. And this is where I want to go backwards to when I set, mentioned that, let's say you have a job. That's a fact. I have a job. Let's say you hate your job and you think, oh, job, I hate my, you don't even realize that you're telling yourself that you hate it necessarily, but you're going to take a lot of actions to get out of that job, to find a new job, to network with other people, all the things you might be doing. But if you haven't cleaned, oh, let's, let's do this. You have a job, but you don't really like but you're thinking it's going to be really, really hard to find another job. If that thought is playing in your brain, if that's the soundtrack running through your brain, it's going to show up in all of your actions. You're probably not going to like get out there, meet all the people, be confident, excited about the opportunities. You're probably going to be looking for evidence. This is really hard to find another job. Is this making sense so far? Okay, good. I've got Christy nodding, which is helpful. <laughs> mm. So the job that you don't like is not causing any problems until you have a thought about it. And then the thought creates the feeling and then all of your actions cascade from that feeling. So again, if you're feeling motivated, think about a circumstance in your life that's created a thought, that's created a feeling of motivated and then all the actions you'll take. And then think of the opposite, a feeling of unmotivated in another area of your life and how you would probably not take many actions. And an inaction is a choice, it's an action, right? You're deciding not to do anything. And then the final part of the think, feel and act model 
is the result. And in this case, the way I use this model, the way it's used in um, CBT2 is it's what you create based on your thought. So if the circumstance is it's Wednesday and the thought is um, so behind, I I don't think I'll even get that done by Friday. And then you feel frantic or overwhelmed. And then your actions are you spin and you waste time and you fret and you wonder how it's going to happen. Then you create a result. You're going to make that thought come true. Like you won't get the project done by Friday or you'll get it done, but you'll get it done with a lot of exhaustion or frustration or maybe resentment, right? Versus if you came at it saying, okay, I've got two more days to get this done. What are all the creative ways I could approach the project? And then that would create a feeling that would create different results. Okay. This is what we'll refer to um, throughout the presentation and in the book um, that you're going to get, again, if you didn't pre-download that or, or download the book that was sent, that's not only a book, but this workbook about um, the thoughts and overwhelm, there are a lot of exercises in that workbook that you can refer to. So I want to give you some examples. This is using the model I just um, shared with you and giving you three different circumstances with possible thoughts and then what happens, how it plays out. Just while you're looking at this, this is one of those that I thought it could maybe like rub someone the wrong way. That's okay. Just be rubbed the wrong way, but listen to what can happen when the circumstances I manage a team of five and your thought is, I should have at least two more team members to complete the work we're asked to do, right? And I know that there could be a lot of different feelings, but for the sake of this presentation, we're leaning into overwhelm. So I'm going to use the word overwhelm. It could be resentment. It could be frustration. It could be entitled. It could be um, you feel very um, um, unsupported, all those sorts of things, right? But we're going to use the umbrella term of overwhelm. So when that happens, you then from a place of overwhelm, are maybe going to be more likely to focus on what you lack. I'm just assuming there might be a hiring freeze when I wrote this scenario. So resent the hiring freeze, look for evidence that it's not fair, that you are down two members on your team. You might overwork to compensate for the fewer people. You might indulge in some self-pity. Oh, my word, I have another mistake, but I'm not overwhelmed by it. Judgment. I needed, I needed to give these to you, Jane. <laughs> Stay in judgment, not creativity. Okay. Now there might be other actions you do too, like do an excellent job with your with what is what you are responsible for. But from a place of overwhelmed, it's usually going to lean a little negative than actions you're taking. And then the result is that you create resentment and maybe shut down your creativity about how to accomplish your tasks. I am not saying it's an ideal scenario if you are down two members on a team, let's say that two people resigned and you couldn't rehire. I understand that can be incredibly stressful. But leaning in and staying in overwhelm is never going to be the answer that's going to get you out of that and come up with a solution or even get you to a really clear-headed place to negotiate some more assistance for your team, right? Another one, my colleague said, I can't help you with that project. Notice I didn't say my colleague let me down. That would be a thought. So it, sometimes if you've got to really figure out what the circumstances, you're taking all the adjectives out of it, you're putting in quotes what was actually said. If it's, if it's someone like someone is mad at me, that's a thought. But so-and-so said, so and this and this, that would be the circumstance. And then the thought might be, he's mad at me. So my colleague said, I can't help you with that project. And your thoughts could be, she's not a team player. I already have so much to do. I'll have to work all weekend. This isn't fair. So can you see what's happening here? We're creating some overwhelm based on the way that we are interpreting the fact, I can't help you with that project leads to overwhelm. Maybe some, these are some of the things you do. Ask me how I know that this might be things you do. <laughs> Complain to others, judge your colleague, cancel all your weekend plans, work all weekend, sigh, overeat, lead with impatience at home, snap at somebody else, feel sorry for yourself. I mean, I'm kind of painting a really Debbie Downer picture, but I wanted to, to make an impact that just the circumstance, I can't help you with that project does not need to be linked to sighing, overeating, being impatient, working all weekend. But you're choosing that. You choose all your actions or things you're choosing, and you're choosing it from a place of overwhelm. And overwhelm is usually cutting off your um, problem solving abilities, not abilities. It's cutting off your um, your um, them as your first as a, the problem solving abilities as a first line of defense, right? So you're just creating more disconnection from your team, from your colleagues. There maybe were other people that, who could have been asked, right? Maybe this project doesn't even have to be done by Monday. I mean, there are other things that could be happening if you can get yourself out of overwhelm and think, what are the facts of this situation? What am I thinking about it? And the other way I like to look at thought a thought is an opinion, it's a bias, it's an assumption, it's an interpretation, it's a story, it's a soundtrack. So it's 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 fiction. Now, there are some thoughts that I love so much that I believe so much that it doesn't matter if someone else decides it's fiction, they're part of my belief system. It is part of who I am. It's part of my fabric. 
Um, she is not a team player, would never be a thought I'd adopt to always be a part of my fabric. <laughs> I would want to come from a place of curiosity and compassion if something like that were happening. I don't always do that, but that's how I'd like to lead. And finally, I'm in a job search right now. And if your thoughts are, it's extremely hard to find a job in this market at my age after being laid off with young children. I worked as a career um, counselor for quite a number for a number of years at a college. And it was so funny how every year different kids would have different ideas about the economy. Like, oh, this is a booming time. It's the best time in the world to get a job. And some other, some other student, and I actually work with the alums, but would say, my dad tells me this is like the worst time ever to get a job. And then you start to look at that through that lens. That's what you're going to find, right? It's called that reticular activating device where you're going to, you're going to seek what you, what you, you're going to find what you seek. So if you're feeling overwhelmed because of your age or being laid off or you've got young children or the market's so hard, you're going to look for evidence for that. You might complain about it. You might just spin. You might stay in stuck and not take any actions. You might blame something again, like the ageism, blame the market. You might blame your old company again. None of these things are awful if they're getting you the results you want. But my guess is that you're creating more hardship for yourself if you indulge in stories like this. Is this landing? Is this resonating for people? Is it making sense? Is anyone like, I don't buy that? We have yeses, a yes in the chat. A yes, okay, we'll take one. Okay, good. <laughs> Come on, Smith women. More coming in, don't worry. I want they're, some engagement. they're validating. I they're validating us right now, Kristen. It looks great. Uh, oh, good, good, good. <laughs> I, feel, I feel validated. My thoughts are they are engaging and then I feel validated. There we go. That's good. That's good. That's good. I just want to make sure that I'm I'm, in, I'm heading in the right direction uh, with what I'm sharing with you. Okay. So thoughts that create overwhelm. This is a real kicker too, friends. The thoughts that create overwhelm often include words like never, always, should, everyone, no one, must, have to, can't, extremely. An example would be he shouldn't have done that. Everyone's going to the dance, mom. I should be able to go too, right? These are like, these are thinking in global grand, with grand assumptions or grand interpretations of a situation. And it's ignoring facts. This always happens to me. He never does that. She must, she must know that I'm feeling upset about this. Like all these things are kind of putting yourself in more of a victim-y kind of role too, right? So we're about to do an exercise. Do not censor yourself before I give you the instructions for this exercise. And also see if there are times you're using words like never, always, should, no one, can't, et cetera. Okay. So we're going to take a minute right now, friends, women. And I want you to think of an area in your life where you feel overwhelmed. And then I want you to identify the story you are telling yourself about the situation. And just take one minute to empty the thoughts that are swirling around in your brain your beautiful brain onto that paper. And this is what I refer to as a thought download. And ideally you would do this for five minutes. For the sake of time, we're gonna do this for one minute. Go back and do this later for five if you, if, if, if you find it useful. What I will also share with you is if you did this for seven days in a row, you would discover that most of the thoughts that end up on that piece of paper are pretty negative. And I find if I can get a client to do this for more than seven days in a row, they'll continue to do it. But if they only do it for seven days, they just feel icky. SAT word. <laughs> and they don't do any more. They're like, that's it. I, I, I'm, a, I'm a judging, terrible person. I hate all the things that are swirling in my head. And I don't want to know anymore. There's nothing that can happen without awareness, right? So this is an awareness activity. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and set my alarm or my timer for one minute. And away you go. Okay. That's a minute, friends. A minute goes pretty quickly. Or for some, maybe it went very slowly. See, that would just be a thought about the circumstance. One minute to do a thought download. <laughs> We're not going to go into any more about that. That's for you to, to look at, to review. Um, and that's the, I spent the most time on thoughts because that really is the overarching um, takeaway I want you to get from today, that you have complete agency over your thoughts. No one is making you think anything. Nobody is. You're an adult woman. You are able to think whatever you want to think. It's all your choice, what you think, what you feel, and what actions you take. So if you can become more deliberate about what soundtrack you're playing, the way I like to say it is I'm taking the aux cord back, although probably all the cars are so fancy now, but I still have a car that needs an aux cord. <laughs> Oh, I'm taking it back and I'm choosing the thoughts. I'm choosing the playlist. I'm choosing the soundtrack that's going to create uh, feelings in me that are going to get me to take the actions to produce the results I want in my life. And again, I'll say, I will produce them. Um, okay. The next one, and this one will go a little bit faster, is unmade decisions. This one really... Um, 
Hmm. At, at first glance, it seems somewhat simple, like just make the darn decision, right? But I understand there's so many things and especially for women, there's so much self-doubt and perfectionism and um, second guessing and um, being hooked to other people's praise or criticism that prevents you from making a decision. So this is a much deeper topic, but I want to give you the, the overview of how you can lean into making some decisions as a means of reducing your overwhelm. So the reason we don't make a decision is we're worried it's going to be the wrong decision. That's pretty much sums it up, right? So we do research and more research, and then we crowdsource, and then we do a pros and cons list, and we, and that should be a dot, dot, dot after that. We just keep taking more action. Now, remember, I was sharing with you before, it's very Smith-like to go right into the action line and not stop and think, what are the thoughts I'm thinking about this decision? So let's say that you would like to leave that job and you instead decide that you are going to, um, actually, let's, let's stop right there. I'm going to come back to that. So here's what you do. This is the, the secret sauce. You pre-decide that whatever decision you make it will either create learning and growth or it'll be a win. That's it. It will be who you partner with, what house you buy, which job you take. Nothing, nothing is the end of the road. You are never stuck unless you tell yourself, I'm stuck. This is a bad decision. I am not talking about things that others or myself might consider immoral or um, I, you know, I'm not leaning that way. We're talking about things like, should you take the job or not take the job? You are able to recover from anything that happens like that. And it's the story you tell yourself, I really messed up. I shouldn't have left that place. And now I can't make as much money or, or I should have done this sooner. I shouldn't have stayed so long. Any of those shoulds are going to create some weight, some burden, some overwhelm on you, right? So if there's no right or wrong decision, they're just decisions. Remember the decisions of circumstance until you have a thought about it then it doesn't serve you to overthink, consider every angle, do exhaustive research. Once you've done enough thinking, enough angle looking, enough research, I am not saying we don't do our due diligence. I definitely believe in informed decision-making, but you know, you know by how it feels in your body when you are past the informed decision-making point and you are now spinning and you are overthinking and that overthinking is leading to no action. That's the kind of, that's what I'm talking about here. Um, I have a client right now who is really, really trying to decide if she should leave her marriage or not leave her marriage. Either way, she's going to be fine. Either way, he's going to be fine. But not making a decision is creating so much overwhelm and it's not creating any clarity, right? And I say she's going to be fine because she tells me she's going to be fine. I'm not making that judgment. She also thinks that her husband will be fine. But, um, and they have a ten, oh, they have a ten year old, and so they're concerned about her. If they just make an informed decision and say this is the right decision for all of us, they will they will create evidence that it is okay. If if you are someone who opposes divorce, then just use a different example. But that's something I want to share with you about decision making. Okay, here we go. I'm going to put this into the model now. I've not committed to moving into industry X, even though it's what I've told myself I most desire to do. That would be a circumstance because most people could say, yeah, she does talk about that a lot. She does say she'd like to go into that industry. If the thought is, it may be very hard to make the switch. I'll probably make less money. I may have to move. I may not like the culture. I might be too old. My friends will think I'm crazy. You see what I'm saying? And I, I, when we do a model, we usually just use one thought, but I wanted to give you a bunch. I probably need to overthink about this for a few more months, right? And you're doing this because you're scared. Someone mentioned earlier on, and they were that would be correct, that they are overwhelmed because of fear. Fear is a part of overwhelm. And it's very, very common for us to stay in uh, paralysis because we're scared makes total sense. We are programmed. Our brain, our primitive brain is programmed to avoid risk and fear involves risk. Most of the time you're stepping into a very uncomfortable feeling, right? So I don't want to minimize this again. This is a, this is a, um, this can be a very, a much more robust topic. I'm just trying to give you the overview of it. So um, if the actions are that you crowdsource, you worry, you look for evidence that's silly, you put off deciding, you do more research, you know, you're doing all these things. It's not getting you to the results of committing to moving into that industry or saying, nope, I'm not going to move into that industry. And I want to like, have you think about a time when you finally made the decision and how what was available to you was 
levity, with lightness afterwards. It might not have been what you experienced, but it's available to you once you make the decision. And what I like to say is the first decision isn't actually the powerful one. It's the decision after the decision. So if you've decided to leave your job and take this other job or try to get into this other industry, that's one decision. The next decision is I am committed to this decision no matter how hard it is, no matter what fear comes up for me, no matter what other people say. So you're further embedding it as the right decision for me right now. And that's all that matters. This is about you and you having agency over your life. So if you don't do that, you're just going to create that overthinking spiral that is really, it's like a riptide. I really look at it like a riptide. It's very hard to get out of that, right? I want you to be up there like in the canoe with the oars, like just sort of riding the waves. You're going to have waves. You're not going to feel great all the time. There's going to be anxiety, nerves, all that sort of stuff. But on the other side of, of all of that could also be more authenticity, more joy, more um, alignment for you. So decision-making, here we go. We're going to do the same thing. Now, also, I want to say this because I've seen this happen too. someone who just gets stuck trying to decide what color to paint her bedroom. Okay, let's just gag and go. Let's it, I feel uncomfortable, but I'm going to go in and make the decision and go. I can always repaint the bedroom. It's not that serious, right? But come on, maybe you've done that or you have a friend who's done that. It's it's just um, it's training the brain to say that the, to, to, to remind you that there's a wrong decision. You might make the wrong decision, right? Okay, so it can be about your professional life, relationship, finances, et cetera, what to do with an elderly, like how to assist an elderly parent, what's the best thing for your child, what's the best thing for your pet, should you even get a pet, should you have that surgery for your pet, I mean, all these different things can really create a lot of overwhelm, right, the piles in your kitchen, I hear that a lot too, and so one of my clients said, I'm just going to call them altars, just a lot of little altars all over my kitchen, and now I don't, I like she, she neutralized it, it doesn't, it doesn't feel heavy and awful to me any longer, all right, I'm going to start my timer again again, one minute. And this one might be a little bit harder. And if you, at the end of a minute, just even have one decision that you realize is hanging over your head that could really help you move along and, and reduce overwhelm, you've won. So here we go. One minute. Okay, guys, a little taste of what that's like to brainstorm and think about what unmade decisions, open decision loops are in your life that you want to close. And what I'd offer you is that um, after this or sometime later this week, go back and look at that list, even if it's just one or two things on that list, and decide what one or two things you could choose to make a decision about that would move the needle the fastest, that would actually create more space for you, more mental space. I mean, like they say in a house, clutter is just an unmade decision. You don't know, you haven't decided what to do with that, so it's just clutter. That's the same in your brain. There's a lot of clutter in our brains. And um, making decisions can really re remove a lot of that clutter. And again, if you believe either way, you'll be okay. You'll be okay. You have you. You are a smart, capable woman. You have agency over yourself. Either way, it will be the right decision for you. Then it sort of reduces the fear involved in making it. Okay, the final of three causes of mental self-care. I mean, of mental, I mean, of overwhelm. <laughs> It's what I call mental self-care. Then the key, the cornerstone to self-care, mental self-care is creating boundaries for yourself. So blurred or absent boundaries are um, kind of a, a shortcut to overwhelm. Let me explain to you a little bit about boundaries. So boundaries are a way of respecting yourself, your time, your space, your feelings, et cetera. They, and they also inform other people of your standards. So if you have set certain clear boundaries that people are aware of, it's informing other people how to treat you. When your life is a game of whack-a-mole, boundaries are not present. It's, it's just not possible that they are. And overwhelm is. When you're running on fumes, you're exhausted, you're serving, 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 there are no boundaries and overwhelm is present. When you lean into perfectionism, people-pleasing, hyper-achieving, there's even more, but those are three of them. Boundaries are often not present and overwhelm likely is. Can I get an amen? Like <laughs> when you, I think that we can often feel like to be a good person, a nice person, a team player, um, a value add, I need to be available to everyone else. I need to be um, taking on more. I need, I need, I need. The word need too can really be one of those signals. Like that's a story you're telling yourself that is not creating the results you want in your life. So effective boundaries. 
they are promises, not threats. And I'm going to give you an example in just a moment. They're made out of love and kindness. They require emotional maturity. It's very different than like a three-year-old, like telling you something about what you may or may not do, right? Or an immature colleague who is just laid down the law that they are leaving at five or maybe even 501, but that's it. They're not doing anything beyond that, right? So I'm not referring to like these inflexible statements. I'm talking about tapping into your maturity and not being rigid and coming from love and compassion and always about, this is always about you, what you will do in a situation, not what someone else cannot do. This is not about controlling another person. Um, I do love that they don't have to be spoken aloud. You don't need to like be going through the streets with the big, um, what do you call that thing? The big yelling through one of those things. A megaphone. Yeah. Thank you, megaphone. <laughs> saying, I am now putting a new boundary in place, right? I had this guy that would over talk in meetings at my last job. And I just made a quiet decision in my head that I would just keep talking when he talked, when he started talking, if, if I had the floor, I mean, I wouldn't. And I didn't have to state that a lot. I didn't have to say, listen, buddy, <laughs> this is the rule, right? I just, he became very aware that, oh, Kristen doesn't stop talking um, just because I'm talking, right? And I wasn't being a bitch about it. I was just like, oh, I've already pre-decided this is my boundary. When I have the floor until I've completed my, my reporting, um, I will keep talking. Okay. Um, there are decisions you make ahead of time. Did you see what I just said too? Like I pre-decided before I even entered that meeting. Oh, I know how I'm going to compose. I know I'm going to, how I'm going to handle myself. If this happens, I'll show you the formula in just a second. So it's letting people know, letting you reminding yourself what you will and won't allow. And they are created to remind you that you are 100% responsible for what you choose to allow and not in your life. You're not at the mercy then of anything else. You're not burdened by something else unless you choose to be right. So here is the formula. Very, very simple. If or when X happens, I will. I don't know why the lines didn't show up. They're showing up over here. But anyway, it's basically a sentence. If and when um, X happens, I will X. If you speak over me during the meeting, I will continue to talk. That was a boundary. I just, I just decided in my own brain. I didn't have to tell anyone else. If you begin to yell, I will leave the room. You're not telling someone you can't yell. And also this does not apply to any form of abuse or mental illness. We're not talking about those situations. But if you're with a relatively healthy person, you may try to tell someone else how to behave or how to act. And I'm also talking about someone over 18. Um, but um, it doesn't mean it's, it's, it's going to be probably fairly ineffective, but you can always tell them, remember, a promise, not a threat. Um, if you yell, I'll leave the room very calmly very, very emotionally mature. It doesn't have to stir up a bunch of junk. Um, if you choose to talk about people, I'll shift or leave the conversation. That's also something that's happened before, I'm sure to you, where you didn't even have to state it. You didn't say, I am leaving this conversation right now because you are speaking of ill of someone else. If that's important to you and that's part of your value system, say it. But you don't have to engage that way. You can simply go, oh, look what's happening. I've already made this decision that I'm going to shift or leave. If I'm offered dessert, I will decline. So it doesn't have to be big, big things about how you're being treated, right? It can be very, it, it, I love this next one. When I wake up, I'll not negotiate the exercise I've already pre-planned. This is the one that I at 54, I'm working on. <laughs> so uh, when my colleague asks for my help, I will say yes, only if I actually have margin in my schedule. See how that's emotional maturity. It's not like when my colleague asks for help, I will never say yes, because I have too much work to do. Like that's just being emotionally immature to say it that way. So these are some examples of boundaries. Okay. And again, the boundaries can be about your time. They can be about relationships, information, conversations, what you will consume. And that doesn't have to just be food. It can be the news you'll consume, what you're going to read, the conversations you're willing to, well, I guess that's consuming conversations, what you will drink. And then your thoughts, of course, too. What thoughts you're going to allow behind the red velvet rope and what thoughts you are not going to allow behind the red velvet rope. Um, oh, also sleep. I don't know. I, I, someone put menopause in the, um, I hear you sister in the biggest way, <laughs> in the overwhelm. And um, that's one of those I want to bend and say, no, no, for sure. It's totally menopause's fault. But here's what is true. There are actual symptoms, right? Menopause overall would just be neutral, but the symptoms you're experiencing would become the circumstance. And then you'd have a thought about that symptom. And then if you're feeling overwhelmed, it's more, it's less likely you're going to get creative and figure out how to solve for it. Right. And one of those big ones is sleep. How are we going to sleep with all these, uh, hot flash interruptions is, uh, could be something. So, so in that example, <laughs> when we're talking about sleep, that would be like setting up a sleep hygiene protocol. Like I don't, I don't take the, I don't take phone calls after this amount of time. I don't, I don't consume caffeine after this sort of time. It's a boundary. 
And if you just start to look at all the ways that you're not even looking at something as a boundary, it's just a decision you made, but guess what you just did? You made a decision. See how boundaries and decisions go together. Then you're getting more and more aware and practicing um, not allowing overwhelm to come behind your red velvet rope. Okay, so it's exercise time after we do one model. So here's the model. My boss has asked me three times this month to complete another colleague's work. The thought, this is now coming from a very an emotionally mature place. I'm committed to adding value and supporting her while also being realistic about what I can accomplish without continued overworking. Think of that thought versus, I cannot freaking believe she asked me another time to do so-and-so's work, right? Or what's up with so-and-so? He's so lame. I mean, these thoughts might go through your brain. Of course, we're humans. We're not going to be without reactions and judgment, right? But you just want to check and go, okay, I'm going to put that thought to the side for a second and choose a thought that's actually going to create a result I want. Because I don't want to do that person's work another time unless I can do a little negotiating. So here's what we do. That you don't feel overwhelmed probably when you tell yourself I'm committed to adding value and I want to support her and I don't want to overwork. I feel calm. And then your action would be putting a boundary in place. And this one would have to be spoken, friends. The next time my boss asks me to do another person's work, I'll show her my calendar and list of responsibilities and ask her what we can remove to make room for this new work. Very simple. It's just being an adult. It's not reactive. It's not toddler with a knife running all around in your brain. It's like, this is my boundary. Now, she doesn't have to approve of that, guys. We understand. She can say, too bad. You have to do that work and this work. And then you have a choice to leave if you want to leave. You have options. You are not stuck anywhere. And don't say you have to stay because of dot, dot, dot. You are creating that have to. I understand the importance of making money, of putting shelter over your head or your family's head. But when you come from that, I have to, I have no choice, then you will make sure there are no choices for you. You will remove all choices, all creativity. Okay. Then the result is I take responsibility for my role in not creating overwhelm, in producing excellent work, and not creating the habit of overworking. This I wanted to end with to tie back to the time audit because so often people are saying, there's just not enough time. There's no time. There's no time. And then you see them like chatting over there with someone for a while, which is important. I think that's very important in an office setting, in all settings to connect with people. I'm not judging that, I'm just noticing that, that we often tell ourselves that there isn't something when there is, we're just choosing not to do the work that we really need to be doing because we don't want to do that work. Or we aren't really trained well enough for that. Like we're, we haven't figured out why we can't get all that done in a certain amount of time. It might be too much. It might be, I'm not trained. It might be, um, it's more a group activity and it shouldn't be a solo activity. It might be that I'm like taking a too long a lunch every day. It might be that I'm like doing all my grocery shopping on my computer and I'm not doing that project. I mean, whatever it is, it's about taking responsibility and not living in it to excuses, right? Okay, last exercise, one minute. I want you to think about, and let's remember this one more time. It's not about the other person. It's not about you can't say that to me or you can't do this. They can do whatever they want. You're going to say, when you say this, this is what's going to happen. When you ask me at the last minute, I will only say yes if there's margin in my calendar. When you speak poorly of my mother, I will leave the, the conversation. Um, this is what I'm trying to show with you. Instead of you can't do that, you shouldn't talk like that. Okay, that's being actually quite arrogant that we know what's better for someone else or that we think that um, we have control over what they're going to do. I mean, come on. Do we live in America? Do we see all the things that are going on? We don't have the control. Okay, so think about the boundary around your time, assignments, relationships, a child, again, how you might handle or what your role would be with an elderly parent, how you spend your vacation days. I don't know about you, but my husband and I have very different ways of vacationing. Let me slow down. We've come to agreement on it, <laughs> but um, that's another time to say, hey, when we go and do this thing, there's going to be two days and I'm just not going to be that active, or there are going to be two days I'm going to go to all the museums and you can just do what you want to do. But any of this pre-deciding boundary is really coming again from love and it's cleaning up what could become messy or reactive or create overwhelm. Okay, here we go. One minute. Boundaries. Okay. We did it. We're going to chat about all this in just a moment, but I wanted to try to stick to that one hour and I'm almost there. It's almost happened. <laughs> okay. So we started with the causes and now let's talk about the solutions. Instead of just thoughts being a cause, how about intentional thoughts being a solution? Instead of unmade decisions, let's talk about making decisions as a solution. Instead of blurred or absent boundaries, let's talk about clear boundaries as a solution to overwhelm. 
none of these are actually as difficult as just living in overwhelm. So if you can get over, like pick it apart, figure out what's actually going on and solve in these three areas, it will do wonders for how the overwhelm is reduced and ultimately eliminated. Um, and as a quick little story, I do consider myself really like getting the five on the AP exam when it comes to over not being overwhelmed because I've practiced this so and I've trained my brain so. And was it a week or two ago, Emily, I was to meet with you and we were supposed to go over this whole project and some things that happened in my life, including a dishwasher overflowing and raining on my office and an ill parent. And I completely spun out in overwhelm. And even though I knew what to do, I wasn't doing it. So I do want to share with you, it doesn't mean that you will never feel overwhelmed if you start to take these if you start to do this, but here was, here's what was so lovely about the situation. And I love that I have a collegial relationship with Susan and with Christy, that when I share what was actually going on in my life, that were just circumstances, my dishwasher overflowing, that's just a circumstance. Um, they were so gracious, like, oh my word, let's reschedule. This doesn't, this doesn't even make sense. I didn't have to go in and say, I have a boundary that when this is happening in my home life, I may not, you know, conduct business. I will never not show up for a meeting that I've scheduled for, with someone else, right? I wasn't going to use that as an excuse, but it still means that overwhelm is going to happen, friends. It's just that you get out of it, get out of it so much faster. That's what it was. I haven't been swimming in overwhelm. I've been feeling a lot of emotions, but not overwhelm. So here's the call to action for this week, maybe even today, if you, if you carve out a bit of time or just even sometimes it's just a split second decision. When you did that thought download and maybe you uncovered some shoulds or have tos or extremes or can'ts or won'ts, is there one thought in there that you know you could eliminate from the soundtrack playing in your brain that would immediately reduce overwhelm in some area of your life? And if you need help with that, I always lean toward whatever you think should be happening. What you should be doing, someone else should be doing, the system should be doing, someone should be behaving, all that. You can, if the, you can't figure out what one it would be, think of what your shoulds are and see if you could just scrub one of those. The next is, is there one decision you can make that you've been putting off? And again, it literally could be where you're going to take vacation or it could be that you're going to quit your job. It can be a smaller thing or a bigger thing, but it's going to leave space in your brain for other bigger decisions. And then is there one boundary you can create with yourself? If you, if you just want to begin practicing with yourself, that you will keep this promise you've made to yourself about fill in the blank um, and you will not uh, indulge in excuses, that would be a boundary. Okay, so these are the ways you've probably heard before about reducing overwhelm. And they're all lovely. I mean, come on, we're Smithies. We love a cup of tea at Friday at four, <laughs> taking a bath, going for a walk, calling a friend. I agree with all of these. They're excellent ways to band-aid overwhelm, but they do not solve for it. They are lovely ways to decompress your nervous system. They are lovely ways to connect with another, but these are the actual ways that will solve for it and then enjoy that yoga, that meditation, that long run, that trip to the library, that browsing the art gallery. Um, when you aren't having these thoughts spinning on repeat in the back of your brain while you're trying to reduce your overwhelm, right? So getting very aware of what you're thinking, getting clear on what is a circumstance and what is thought. In other words, what's a fact and what's an or an interpretation or an opinion. Give yourself some grace when you become aware of your negative thoughts. Remember, if you choose to um, start doing some thought downloads on the regular, you are going to uncover a lot of negative thinking. And again, that's okay. Your brain was trying to protect you. It's trying to protect you from risk, keep you safe. It's looking for danger. It's looking for ways you should stay just how you are and not take any risk. Making no overthinking. Overthinking is an indulgent emotion, is an indulgent action. It does not you ever. Thinking serves you. Due diligence serves you. A bit of research serves you. Overing it doesn't serve you. It's really a buffer so that you just don't have to feel the feeling of commitment to the decision. Taking full responsibility for your thoughts and your feelings. No one can tell you what to think or what they can tell you whatever they want. You, you are choosing what you, what you want to think and what you want to feel. Um, that is not always the case for children. Um, so, but for an adult, you are the one choosing. So you're allowed, you're invited to go backwards in your brain and think of all the different ways you've been programmed or, or, um, or come up with beliefs and just decide, does it really serving me? I like to ask myself, is it true? Is it kind? Is it helpful? 
And even if it's all three of those things, it doesn't mean I still have to believe it or think it. It just isn't serving me right now. So creating the boundaries out of love. Remember, it's out of love. It's out of emotional maturity. It's out of pre it's not reactive. It's fine to create a boundary in the moment, of course. But if you can get in the practice of doing it in advance, it's save you a lot of heartache, a lot of, um, a lot of overwhelm and then catch all your shoulds. Shoulds is a really big one. You've heard that stop shoulding. I think it's hysterical, but shoulds really are. I mean, I like to use the word arrogant. Like, why do I think I, I know what is better for that person? That is not the path maybe that they are, that they are choosing to take and want to take. It's not what I think is better for them might not be. Um, and then again, we're not talking about abuse and all that sort of thing. So just stick with a little bit of levity in those regards. So this, I think you're getting in a one pager, right, Christy? Yes. If you want it. Okay. So that'll be sent to you as just a reminder. And again, I'm not just saying yoga, meditation, tea, all those things. I'm just reminding you that they're not foundational. This is foundational. And those are um, lovely additions to this. Okay. So I promised you three things that we were going to get clear on what actually causes overwhelm. And what I share with you with you is that it was thoughts unmade decisions and blurred boundaries or absent boundaries, then teach you three strategies. So we talked about how to really take a look at those thoughts and eliminate one, why you're not making decisions and maybe that it's time to make the decision and stop overthinking. And then also to go ahead and put some promises, not threats in place about what you will allow and not allow in your life. And so those would be the ways I hope that you apply and make them practical solutions for you to reduce your overwhelm. One more time, if you would like to get the uh, workbook that I have made that is a short, like a, a bridge version of this slideshow, feel free to scan this right now. And then I, again, I think I told you, I finished my work today at five and at five o'clock, I'm going to get on and just randomly choose two people and I'll ask for your addresses and I'll send you these two gifts. Um, this is important for me to share with you because I said to you before that my mission is to get people out of overwhelm so they can do what they're meant to do in this life. And I've had, this is, this is, um, sharing factual information. This is also promoting what I know I can do for people, but I think it's very important for us to own what we know we can do really well for other people. But when you can get someone out of overwhelm, these are the kind of things that can happen. So publish your bestseller book. I had a client who decided not to leave her marriage. Um, how to manage her time and sleep. Someone became a college president. Someone else found love and became engaged. Someone healed from a divorce and grew a wine business. Like they were able to just stop swimming in this so that they could go and do what they were meant to do, what was delightful to them, what's, what, what they were using as a, a reason why they couldn't do things before they eliminated and they were able to create this space for themselves. So there we go. This is a QR code. I'm so proud of these QR codes. This one is just to my basic website. If you just want to see the basic website, I've got so many resources, friends. I have um, I have a YouTube channel as well. I've got a lot of shorter videos and then I've got a whole bunch of blogs. Every Tuesday, I send out um, an email with more information like this that you'll be registered for if you go to the email or if you sign up for that other workbook. But now I would love to answer any questions you might have. I also want to mention before we get too far into questions, Kristen is joining a cadre of coaches that we have available for Smith alums. Um, they are all Smith alums themselves. They host our workshops and then they are available to be referred for one-on-one -on -one coaching. They offer discounts for Smithies that are special just for you. So um, today is not the only day you can access Kristen and her great structures okay, and, yeah. and tools. Um, you can always reach out to me and we can help connect you one-on-one -on -one with, with folks. But now that I've made that spiel, um, are there questions? Yeah, Annie, well, yes, are... this is oh. exciting oh. <laughs> that this hey, is available. Yes. Um, one thing I wanted someone, I forgot not the name of the person, but someone said it can be very, oh, here, Naomi, changing thoughts can be difficult. I wonder if you have any specific tactics you like to use or teach. I do. Um, first of all, you have to decide what's your motive. Why would you want to change the thought? Is the thought not serving you? Is it creating a feeling in you that you no longer want to feel? that can make it much easier. Like, I know this is not serving me. This is maybe a poison thought or an unuseful thought, unkind, no longer true for me. And you would literally practice not thinking it. So when I have gave you that image before of the red velvet rope, you can practice unthinking it. Or another tactic is to do something called the thought ladder. And that is just becoming aware that you're thinking it. So let's just say um, something really innocuous. Let me just think. I um, uh, 
can, can someone just throw a thought out that they want to stop thinking? Could someone give me an, an example and I'm going to do a thought ladder with it, please? No one? No one has a thought? Okay. I made the wrong decision. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. Thank you so much, Katie. I made the wrong decision. So the first step would be you're literally climbing up a ladder. At the bottom rung is I made the wrong decision. At the very top of the ladder is um, what your ideal thought would be. I don't want to assume I know what your ideal thought would be. It could, but let's, so Katie, what would you like to be thinking instead of I made the wrong decision? And I can do this live with you too, if you want, if it's, I don't want to put someone in the, I don't I'm put you in. What about, I will never get this work done. I made the right, oh, I'm sorry, Kitty gave it oh. to me. So I made the wrong decision and she wants to get to, I made the right decision. Perfect. So what you're trying to do is build awareness and separate yourself from the thought. That's not serving you. It never is going to serve someone to say, I made the wrong decision, right? You're going to create some space between you and the thought. So the next wrong would be, I'm noticing I'm telling myself I made the wrong decision. And sit with that for a while. How does that feel? Maybe that feels less taxing or burdensome or frustrating. I'm noticing I'm telling myself I made the wrong decision. And then the next rung up the ladder would be, I'm wondering what it would be like to not tell myself I made the wrong decision. You see, like you're just kind of separating it and then getting to a point where it's, I wonder in what ways that was the right decision or what have I, that wrong, how did that wrong decision teach me things that's making it seem like a right decision? Do you see what I'm doing? So I don't have like an actual prompts for all the rungs on the ladder necessarily, but you are just trying to move away from that and get yourself to a place where you can make the decision neutral, first of all. And that would be midway up the rung, probably like, I am willing to think it was just a decision. It wasn't right. It wasn't wrong. Is that making sense for people? I see some head nods, which is helpful. So it's not lying to yourself. It's not Pollyanna like, oh, I go from wrong decision to that was a perfect decision. No, that's never going to work and it won't stick. There's no way you'll believe that. However, if you take the... Um, okay, Mary Fetter. Okay. Will I have access to the chat afterwards, Christy? Um. We can see. I just want to make <laughs> I'm sure, not I can sure. these people's questions. Okay. So again, what we're trying to do is get your from a judgy state. I made the wrong decision. That's a very judgment filled thought to a neutral thought. I made a decision to an, to an intentional thought, an ideal thought, what you, what we, what you um, most want to think I made the right decision and then fill in all the blanks with noticing, wondering, how could that have been the right decision actually? What did I, what, how did I benefit from that? What I'm calling a wrong decision? Is that making sense to you? It's really a time of, inqu of, of inquisition. Um, and only you can carry yourself up a thought ladder. I mean, it's helpful to have a coach prompt you, but it's really, you get to decide. And some people can get up a thought ladder in like half a second. And for some, it takes three years and that's fine. You're not behind. It's a matter of the how deeply felt that thought is and how much um, shame, anger, worry, resentment, et cetera, you have attached to that first thought. Okay. Um, other next question. Uh, I'll never get this work done. Is it true that you'll never get this work done is what I would offer. And if it's true, okay, then is all this work necessary to get done? Who can help me get this work done? What other options do I have for getting the work done? It's again, it's a time to look at the question or look at the, the thought that's in your brain, get it on paper and then say, is this true? Yes, it's true. I will never get this work done. Okay. Is that kind? Maybe it's kind. I don't know. Is it helpful? No, because it's judging the situation and it's not opening myself up to creativity. How could I get all this work done? What are some ways I could um, outsource some of this work? I wonder if there's parts of this work that doesn't even have to get done. You see what I'm saying? You're just picking it apart a little bit because you're saying it like it's the news. I'll never get this done. That's just a fact. Everyone looking at it knows it's just a fact. It's not a fact. It's a thought until you decided like, no, it's a fact. Well, do you have to sleep? Maybe you don't have to sleep. Maybe you could work nonstop for three weeks and get that work done. Is that what you want to do? No, but you, you start to play around with all different angles, right? Of how could I do this? I like to say that so often we ask, our, ask ourselves really dead end questions. Like, why was I so, why was I so stupid? <laughs> well, that's not going to, you're not going to come with many, many things instead of like, I wonder how I could have handled that situation differently. So, so different. So there's that, there's that dead end questioning. And then there's that 
expansive questioning, right? So restrictive questioning, expansive questioning. And I just think sometimes we just like keep, keep hitting that dead end and think, why do I keep getting the same results? Well, because you're asking yourself a question that has a yes or no answer, or is just keeping a story alive that you're stupid or that you made a mistake, or that was the wrong decision, or that you'll never figure out how to sleep again, or it's just not true unless you want to make it true. And then you will just continue to feed that story, right? They say, what do they say? Like, uh, your mind is a garden. Hold on. Your mind is a garden. Your thoughts are the seeds. You can grow flowers or grow weeds. <laughs> I have that in my other room, but that's something you can water the decisions that you've made. You can water the thoughts that are keeping you stuck, or you can say, gosh, I'm wondering how this, this whole situation, there's actually an opportunity in this. Um, Kristen, do you see this last question from Mary here? Yeah. Um, and I think it's a great one actually to end our Q&A with. Perfect. Suggestion for a good method to do a brain dump to help organize the swirling thoughts. Mary, you're going to love this because I know we all, I mean, it is so fun to speak with Smith women because I, I don't want to assume I know how all of us think, but I know how we were all taught. So that's fun. That's, we all have, we share that. The method is not really a method. You get out a piece of paper and a pen or a pencil, and you just empty your brain. You literally give yourself pre-decide. I like to pre-decide in the morning. I'm going to give myself five minutes. I love doing it with a cup of coffee. And I just write everything down and thinking, and it can sometimes become a grocery list. That's not really the intent of a, of a, uh, of a thought download, but if it's working for me that day, that's fine. Sometimes I'm like, I can't even access what I'm thinking. I'm not even sure what I'm thinking. I'm just so obsessed about being ticked with that person that I can't think of anything else. Right. And that's really what I'm thinking. So I just want to get that all down. And then, um, what I would suggest for the first week too, is don't even read them. Don't go back and read them yet. Just do, 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 do. And then after a week, go back and say, what are the patterns here? Where am I being a victim? Where am I being a heroine? Where am I judging? Where am I being creative? Where am I being curious? Where am I being restrict where am I just being really restrictive and take full responsibility for all of it all of it because these are your thoughts that no one is making and forcing you to think you're choosing to think them right and um oh that's right so good um okay so that that would be what I would say can I just mention one more thing here about um boundaries of course Okay. I, um, I'm going to get really intimate with you here, Lisa. I had a similar situation when I was raising my children, they're 24 and 22. And in my situation, my parents were fighting a lot when they would be watching the girls and my older daughter would come home and say, gosh, and then re recount all the fights. It was never my business for me to say, you all cannot fight in front of my children. Of course not. They're adult people. They can do whatever they want. But I did suggest to my mom that if she and my dad wanted to continue to fight, that um, I would not continue to ask her to be with my, to, to, to take care of my daughter without me in, in the presence. And listen, fighting is natural and normal. I'm not saying that you should fake that you're madly in love when you're with my child, <laughs> but I didn't need that sort of, because it was creating some stress for her, right? Now you're saying that she's actually yelling at you and criticizing me. Yes. Okay, perfect. So I think Lisa, you can very kindly say, gosh, mom, I'm just not open for this. So when you decide to yell or criticize me in front of my, my four-year-old, um, I'm, um, I'm going to exit. I'll be taking her away or I will, um, I don't know what the situation is. If you're, I think you're in person. I'm not buying your ice cream because your mom won't. Yeah. And that actually looks a little bit deeper <laughs> than, than for your, on your mom's sake. I feel my child must be, uh... Yeah. So Kristen, I just yeah. want to let you know, I, did you get those messages directly? I'm not seeing them in the chat. So I don't know if you want to share with us more of the situation we're responding to just oh, because I'm we so can't sorry. see these messages. Okay. All I, good. Won't any, I won't say anything more, but this is, um, there's someone who's grappling with, um, her mother disregarding boundaries that she's put in place for how to handle her for, to oh. how to be around her four-year-old mm -hmm. child. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I understand that. And I think you have every right person who wrote this. Sorry that I said your name before. <laughs> Dear, wonderful, smart person. Um, and you, you, if you set yourself up to think that you're going to change your mother, then you're going to create such overwhelm for yourself. It's not possible. It's literally not possible unless she'd like to change herself. Right. But it's completely possible that you say, gosh, um, if you decide to feed my child ice cream, um, I will not have her come to visit you any longer. If you decide to speak poorly of me in front of my daughter, 
we will not be visiting. And it's, it is, that is self-love. That is the basis of self-care mom. That's the basis of self-care. And think of the modeling you're doing for your daughter. You're showing her, this is not, I do not allow this. Now also friend check in, are you being really rigid? Are you thinking she only needs to be eating organic fruits and vegetables? And so no one should be feeding her ice cream. Okay. Is that really true? Is it true that a little bit of ice cream with your mom is going to hurt her? Maybe it is. I don't know. And maybe it's so, it's so you're so opposed to the idea of it. I get it. But just ask yourself, where am I being an emotionally mature adult? And where am I being rigid? Where am I taking responsibility? Where am I blaming? Right? It can be a little uncomfortable, but it's the only way out is just to do that inquisitive. And how can I still be in relationship with my mother without her changing at all? Because I can't make her change. Now you can ask her to be a robot or play an act. Like you can say, mom, please, people, please me. I need you to say these things when I am there. I need you to treat my daughter this way. This is the script, read the script. And then I will love you. And then she can come to your house. And if that feels good to you, fine, but be aware of what you're doing. Like this, actually, if I could end on this one, I'm like, cause I find this so funny. I just am always entertained by people who have demands of their partner. Like I, you better get me flowers on Valentine's day or something like that. I'm like, okay, because then, oh, because then I'll know you love me. Or I know he'd love me if he, whatever, fill in the blank or she'd love me fill in the blank. Okay. I call that the Uber eats of a relationship. If I call Uber eats and I order Chipotle and I even pay for the extra guac and then they deliver it to my house. I don't think that Chipotle loves me. I don't think, oh my God, see, oh my God. I paid for that. I asked for that. I ordered that. And I put the order in with Uber Eats and with Chipotle and they took care of it. They're not showing me any love. They're just doing what I've, what I've, uh, what? They're reading my script. How would you say that, right? So if you say to your partner or, or your colleague or anything like, I'll feel better if you do this. Okay, fine. They might do that. They're not doing it because that's really how they feel necessarily. <laughs> and I, I use the flowers with, with partners as sort of a funny example because I see so many people get so distraught when they don't get something like that. And I think, I mean, I guess if my husband told me what to say to him and then I said it, maybe it would feel better, but I wouldn't be telling the truth necessarily, <laughs> right? And so think about that in any situation, you know, you're not allowed to say that mom. And if you do that, then this, you need to behave differently. You're basically saying, read the script. And then I, but I think, it. yes, but I think Kristen, what you are also saying, you're not saying that it's not like you can't still set a boundary, right? Like Ever. you can say Never. to your partner, I'm I would not love feeling this loved or appreciated by you at the moment. Let's talk about how that might look different. That's a different thing than Perfect. Me, I'll know you love me if you buy me flowers yeah. every Valentine's Day, which I say to my husband every year and I don't ever get flowers, but I know he loves me in many other ways. Right. So, um, I love the image of targeted because expectations stated expectations, I believe, of course, that's, that's a healthy relationship. The other yes. would be called like a manual for how we, how we should do it. A loving husband should get someone flowers. Okay, well, that's my manual. It's not your manual. And can we negotiate about that? Sure. And maybe one day he's going to be like, surprise, I'm going to buy you flowers. And it's like April, whatever. I don't know. But we, what I'm doing is sharing you how we set ourselves up. And I love what you said, in a, in a, especially in a non-explosive way. Like, hey, I'm feeling some things here that I'll take ownership for because they're my thoughts. But they're thought like. <laughs> Wait, I'll tell you, I'll tell you this one. So I started, I've been, I went to, I was, a, I've got a master's in counseling too. I studied self-development. I love it. I've worked in it for all these years. Five years ago, I went to coach training. And I did this one week intensive. Like I flew to Dallas. I was coached in a room of 40 people for one whole week. It was amazing, amazing, amazing. I like had the most transformative experience. Like a few months after that, I came back and I was like, can you even get over me? I mean, look at how different everything is. Like this is like amazing. My transformation. <laughs> it's like, I don't. I don't really notice it. And I was like, oh, right. Because mostly I wasn't thinking really kind things about you. <laughs> and I wasn't telling you that, but I was living, I was creating this overwhelm in my brain, right? And it was all my stuff. It wasn't. So he was sort of like, wait, what? You transformed? <laughs> I think, um, no, I did transform how I view everything. And I'm taking full responsibility for all of it now. And not blaming or putting on someone else how things should be, right? So that's that's another thing about like keeping some of this to yourself uh, is not the worst thing. <laughs> yeah. um, okay. Oh, I'm so glad. I'm glad that that helped you, mom, too, with your four year old. And that's that's a that's a lovely time of life, uh, and it's a, such a time when they're they absorb so much that I completely understand why you want to protect her from 
from some negative self, some, some negative talk and stress. I get that completely. And what a great mindset to think about role modeling for others. I think that's another way that sometimes when I'm setting a boundary, I think about what am I showing my family? What am I showing people about how they can treat me? What am I, right? Like it's all about sometimes reframing this in a more external way and thinking about how you are demonstrating behavior that you'd like to see kind of reciprocated back to you or carried out by others. It's just those are helpful ways to just, it's all about reframing things in your mind. I think that's what we've heard from you today, Kristen, right? Yeah, it's just yeah. take it back. Don't let your, your thoughts and your mind and run, you know, over you and, and create situations where, you know, we got to take the steering wheel. We got to calm it down, yeah, come back to, to the center. Too. And yeah. Well, I yeah. also want to offer one thing that we use the word overwhelm, put anything you want in there, anything like I want to feel angry sometimes. I, I don't mind feeling a little resentment. Like there's things that I want to, feel. I just don't want to live in that space yes. because then I won't take any actions. Like there are things happening in the world. I am not proud of, I'm not pleased by, I'm not going to be like, well, let me think how I can get to a positive thought. No, I'm not going to get to a positive thought, but I'm not going to stay stuck in that. What can eventually become a pretty emotionally immature pattern right. because then I won't be moving the needle in whatever way I feel I'd like to, or however I'd like to contribute. So it's, it can get very selfish and very, um, um, self-serving to stay mm. in some of those spaces to out, like to stay in them a little bit longer than, than they are productive. Right. Um, and it just robs you, you know, it just robs you when you want to stay in those, but, but again, I'm, I'm never, none of this is about like not feeling, and I'm glad you brought that up to like not feeling some frustration or resentment. It's just like acting on it instead of like simmering in it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely. Right? So, oh, so fun friends. So fun. So fun. And it's just about two 30 here on the East coast. Um, so we will just take a moment as a group to thank you, Kristen, for an amazing session if you, you feel so everyone. inclined, find the clap your hand react button at the bottom of your screen. Oh, I'm seeing a couple of them show up. Yay, we oh, love that. I love Thumbs up. Before. Oh, I even got a confetti. That's so fun. <laughs> People are loving it. So I love it, friends. I, I want to well. just, yeah, thank you so much for your time, Kristen. And You're I welcome. just, again, our team is here as a resource. Kristen is here as a resource. Thank you again. It's always so wonderful to spend time with fellow Smithies and, and, just benefit from the wisdom we have in our community. So once again, Kristen, thank you so much. You're and so thank you welcome. all for being here today. And I hope you all enjoy the rest of your, your day. Yay, everyone. Yay. Wonderful to be together. I'm so glad it was helpful. Get those journals out. Fantastic. And I love that you're going to share it with other people. This is how we change the world by changing our thoughts. <laughs> because then that leads to changing actions. And that's so important. All right, friends. That's right. Thank Bye. you so thank much. You. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. See you yeah. next time.